Chalice is the sign of our Unitarian faith, lit as we gather together. May this light call your heart to worship. May its warmth kindle the fires of hope and love. May its brightness illuminate all that is human and divine. May you find welcome in this chalice today. Gone. It's an essay entitled Play is Foundation for Religion by Dr. Peter Gray. <clears throat> Some people would take offence at the idea that religion is play. Religion, they would say, is sacred and play is trivial. How can the one be loved with the other? But regular readers of this blog know that I regard play as the highest form of human activity. So I am not demeaning religion when I describe it as play. I have two main points to make in this essay. The first is that all of religion has its roots in play. The cognitive skills that make religion possible are the skills of play, the most central of which is make-believe. The second point is that religion functions best when it does not stray too far from its playful origins. Religion that has lost its playfulness can be dangerous. Here I outline some of the logic and evidence that leads me to these conclusions. The essence of all religion is faith. To have faith is to believe without evidence. To believe without evidence is to make believe. To make believe is to play. All human play involves an element of make believe. Each player accepts, for the duration of the game, a certain imaginary world. In chess, for example, the imaginary world is one in which miniature horse shaped figures are knights and knights can only move in, move in L-shaped hops. The purest form of make-believe is found in the pretend play of young children, who regularly enter imaginary world, worlds in which they may be witches, or trolls, or space travellers, or mums and dads, and where the living room sofa may be a haunted house, or a magic bridge, or another planet, or the office where mum works. To enter into a game, players don't ask for evidence that such and such is true, they simply decide or agree <coughs> that it is. Susie is a witch and Jimmy is a troll because all of the players have agreed to that. The truths of make-believe are truths by choice, not discovery. And so are the truths of religion. To accept a religion is to choose to believe in the religion's truths. And in that sense, at least, all religion is play. The truths of play are true as long and only as long as the play continues. When play is over, or during timeout, Susie and Jimmy may say that they were only pretending to be a witch and a troll, but they would never say that during play. In fact, it would be impossible to, for them to say that during play, because the very act of saying it automatically stops the play and creates a timeout. Religion, for the devout, has no recognised timeout, so the devotees may have no opportunity to say that the religious beliefs are made believe even if at some level of consciousness they know that this is so. I ask the devout reader here, please, to take a brief time out, just to consider my thesis. You will not lose your religion by doing so. Your religious devotion may even profit from the exercise. Children improve their play and become even more devoted to it by taking time outs to think about and possibly reformulate the truths, and the same can happen for adults with religion. My thoughts about the playfulness of religion originated when I was about 11 years old, an age when many people begin to puzzle seriously about the world around them. I was a regular church and Sunday school attendee, and like some of my childhood colleagues, I had difficulty understanding how people could believe the stories. It was clear to me that belief, or lack of belief, had nothing to do with rational intelligence. Some people far more intelligent and rational than I, and some less so, were devout believers. I remember thinking then that religion might be a kind of game, a lifelong game that people knew was a game, but would not say was one. It was like belief in Santa Claus, but more valued. It was belief that people held on to throughout life rather than just in early childhood. These childhood thoughts about religion lay relatively dormant in my mind until quite recently, when, when they were stirred up by my reading about hunter-gatherer religions. As I noted in my, his first essay in this series, Play Makes Us Human, it was inspired by my recent immersion in the anthropological literature on hunter-gatherers. 
I discovered, in my immersion, that hunter-gatherer band societies, as distinct from more complex tribal societies, have certain basic characteristics in common, wherever they are found. Among these characteristics is a high degree of playfulness, which runs through all aspects of their social lives, including their religions. The overtly playful nature of hunter-gatherer religious beliefs and activities renewed my thinking about the idea that religion everywhere has its origins in the human capacity for play. All hunter-gatherer religions are polytheistic. There are multiple deities, and the deities themselves are playful. They are not arranged in a hierarchy of power, taking or giving orders, but are equal players in an ongoing drama that takes place in the spirit world that parallels the physical world in which hunter-gatherers live. The deities themselves are neither all good nor all bad, but are a mixture of the two, much like real people. They are often whimsical and unpredictable. They are not necessarily concerned with human morality. They may help or hurt a person just because they feel like doing so, not because the person deserves it. A common character in hunter-gatherer religions is what mythologists call the trickster, a partly clever, partly bumbling, morally ambivalent being who manages to interfere with the best laid plans of the other deities and humans. The trickster character is not necessarily represented in just one deity. It may be an aspect of personality that runs through most or all of them. The characteristics and actions of many of the deities are comical, consistent with their egalitarian ethos and non-hierarchical means of governing themselves. Hunter-gatherers do not worship their, their deities. They have no kings on earth, so they have no kings in heaven either. In fact, just as they use humour to level any members of their own band who show signs of arrogance, they also use humour to level any deities who might otherwise think too highly of themselves. Here is an example taken from Elizabeth Marshall Thomas's book, The Old Way, about the Juhuansi of Africa's Kalahari Desert. One of the most prominent Juhuan deities, Gao Na, has characteristics that might, at first, lead us to view him as equivalent to the single god of modern monotheistic religions. Gao Na is the creator of the universe. He created first himself, then the other deities, and then the earth, water, sky, sun, moon, stars, rain, wind, lightning, plants, animals, and human beings. Yet, despite such creative power, Gao Na is not particularly powerful in other respects, and he is certainly not especially wise. In fact, the Juhuansi delight in portraying Gao Na as a fool. In Juhuan religious stories, Gao Na, the creator of everything, is unable to control the beings he created and is continuously being outwitted by them. For example, his wives trick him again and again into jumping into a pit full of feces. They tell him that there is a fat eland under a pile of branches, and he leaps happily into the pile to get it, only to fall into the pit. Later, after he has cleaned himself up, they tell him another story about some other prize under the branches, and he jumps in again. Whenever I think of this story, I am reminded of the classic comic strip character, Charlie Brown, who repeatedly believes that this time Lucy will not pull the football away when he tries to kick it. Like Charlie Brown, Gao Na never learns. We know, each time that Lucy sets him up, that Charlie Brown will fall for it. We feel sorry for him, and yet we laugh. That is the plight of us humans, and it is portrayed in Juhuan religious stories, uh, as it was by Schultz on the comics page. The religious practices of most hunter-gatherers include music, dances, sometimes costumes, and lots of overt play. The most serious religious ceremonies for most hunter-gatherer groups are those that involve shamanic exercises. The primary serious purpose of such ceremonies is healing. But the ceremonies also provide an opportunity for band members to interact personally in all sorts of ways with members of the spirit world. Individuals who have the power to do so, the shamans, enter into trance states in which they take on the properties of and or communicate with specific deities. One re researcher, Matthias Gunther, notes that this altered state is generally, generally reached without hallucinogenic substances but through a combination of drumming, singing and dancing, coupled with physical exhaustion. He writes further, often the shaman is a showman who employs rich poetic imagery and histrionics. He may sing and dance, trembling and shrieking and speak in strange mm -hmm. languages. He may also employ prestidigitation and ventriloquism. Shamanic seances are very much performance events, not infrequently with audience feedback. They involve the shaman in role playing, engaging in dialogue with various spirits, each of whose counter roles he plays himself. Among some hunter-gatherer groups, the whole band is involved in the dancing, singing and drumming. All of them, effectively, are shamans, or at least contributors to the shamanic experience. 
Among the two Huangzi, roughly half of the men and a third of the women are able to enter into the shamanic trances. When spirits are called forth in such exercises, in apparently any hunter-gatherer group, they are not treated reverently, they are treated much as the people treat each other. The communication may involve mutual joking, teasing, laughing, singing and dancing, as well as requests for healing. Anthropologists refer to the shamanic and other religious ceremonies as rituals, probably because that term has come to be used for any religious ceremony that has some sort of regular structure to it. But the ceremonies are not rituals in the sense of strict, uncreative adherence to a prescribed form. In fact, some hunter-gatherer researchers have claimed that the religious rituals that they observed in the groups they studied were indistinguishable from play. The ceremonies typically involve a great deal of the kind of self-determined, creative, imaginative, yet rule-guided action that fits the definition of play. Continuing with Dr. Gray's essay. Hunter-gatherers do not confuse religious beliefs with empirical observations, and they have no concept of heresy. Anthropologists have often described hunter-gatherers as practical people, not much given to magic or superstition. Shamanic healing seems to be an exception, but such healing may actually work to the degree that diseases have psychological components. In general, hunter-gatherer religious ceremonies have more to do with embracing reality than with attempting to alter it. For example, in her book, The Harmless People, Thomas describes how the Gui people, hunting and gathering neighbours to the Juhuansi, use their sacred rain dance not to bring on rain, but to welcome it and partake in its power when they see it coming. Living in the desert, where water is a limiting factor for all life, they might well dance to bring on rain if they thought it would work, but they do not believe they have such power. They can, however, rejoice in the rain and use its coming to raise their own spirits and prepare themselves for the bounty to follow. Another researcher, Richard Gould, in his book, Uara, about a hunter-gatherer culture in Australia, makes the same point in start stating that these people do not seek to control the environment in either their daily or their sacred lives. Rituals of the sacred life may be seen as the efforts of man to combine with his environment, to become at one with it. From my perspective, such ceremonies are a form of play in which aspects of the natural world personified in the deities become playmates. On the dimensions that distinguish religious liberals from religious fundamentalists in our culture, hunter-gatherers appear everywhere to be at the liberal end. Although hunter-gatherers find meaning in their stories about the spirit world, they do not treat the stories as dogma. Neighbouring bands may tell similar stories in different ways, or may tell different stories which contradict one another, but nobody takes offence. The sacred ceremonies of one band may be different from those of another, or may vary considerably over time. Hunter-gatherer parents do not become upset when their children marry into another group and adopt religious beliefs and practices that differ from those they grew up with. To leave one band and join another with different religious practices is, in this sense, like leaving a group who are playing one game and joining another who are playing a different game. There seems to be an implicit acknowledgement among these people that religious stories, while in some ways special and even sacred, are, in the end, just stories. Hunter-gatherers value their beliefs about the spirit world but they apparently don't let those beliefs interfere with their empirical understanding of the physical world in which they live. Here is an example of that, again provided by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. When Toma, a wise Juanzi, was asked matter-of-factly what happens to stars during the daytime, he responded matter-of-factly, they stay where they are. We just can't see them because the sun is too bright. But another time, in a religious frame, Toma answered the same question with a Juhuan legend, in which the stars are antelons, 
that crawl up into the sky at night and return to their sandy pits at dawn. He was apparently not the least bit upset by the contradiction between these two explanations. I wish that all religious people had Toma's wisdom when it comes to such foolish controversies as that of evolution versus creationism. A general function of all play is to give meaning to people's lives and to help them cope with the real world. As described in an earlier post, play helps children come to grips with reality. Playing at being witches and trolls, for example, helps young children think about and understand aspects of their real world that would be hard to understand otherwise. This is true even though the children clearly recognise that the play world is imaginary, not real. In fact, play would not serve its purpose if children did not recognise that distinction. Religion, properly conceived, is a grand and potentially lifelong game in which people use the basic structures of the game, the story outlines, beliefs and rituals, along with their own creative additions and modifications to make sense of their real world and real lives. The stories and beliefs may be understood as fictions, but they are sacred fictions because they represent ideas and principles that are crucial to living in the real world, and they may be held through all of life. It is not surprising from this view that religious stories and beliefs everywhere reflect and elaborate on ideas and themes that are crucial to the society in which the devotees live their real lives. Hunter-gatherers depend on principles of equality and sharing, and so it is natural that their deities are not rulers but equals, who contribute and sometimes fail to contribute as they will. Hunter-gatherers also depend every day on the whims of nature, which they cannot control, so it is not surprising that their deities are whimsical. The best way to deal with unpredictability is through humility and humour, and their religion fosters those traits. Their task is to embrace nature, not to control it, and their religious play with the spirits of the natural world help them to do that. With agriculture, religion changed. Agriculturalists attempt to control nature and so the gods of agriculture are controlling gods. With agriculture and with the land ownership and accumulation of wealth that accompanies it, egalitarianism lost its sway and concepts of lords and masters and of servants and slaves emerged. It is not surprising then that hierarchical concepts of the spirit world emerged in post-agricultural religions, peaking in the Middle Ages, in the dominant monotheistic religions, Islam and Christianity. At a time when most people were servants, it was only natural that religious stories and beliefs would focus on the value of servitude and duty to Lord and Master, and that God would be understood as the Supreme Master the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Such belief gave meaning to a life of servitude and helped the rulers to justify their power. Religion turns bad when the element of play is lost. As religions evolved, or should I say devolved, from the hunter-gatherers comic pantheons to the medieval monotheisms, it became less playful and more dangerous. As nature became an, an enemy rather than a friend, and as the spirit world became hierarchical, the element of fear began to overwhelm the element of play. God became not a playmate, but the supreme source of punishment and reward, to be worshipped, served and feared. As religion became serious, people began to confound the imaginary religious world with the real world. If children playing that they are witches and trolls do not know that they were just pretending, we would worry. 
We know for children that failure to distinguish imagination from reality can be dangerous. We should know that this is even truer in the case of adults and religion. The religions that emerged with agriculture and feudalism have promoted horrors that would be unimaginable to hunter-gatherers. The Aztecs sacrificed human beings to their angry gods. Christians tortured people they called witches and murdered heathens mercilessly. Today, among some groups of Islamists, we find promoters of suicide bombings who put religious beliefs above their concerns for people. If service to God is the highest value, and if God is fearsome and egotistical and punishing, and if religion is confounded with reality, then all these horrors in the name of religion become possible. Religion of that type does not make us human in the sense by which I mean that statement in the title to this series. The remarkable thing today is that our societies continue to evolve, that as our societies continue to evolve, so do our religions. As we have taken medievalism and entered an era of growing democracy, many people have, sorry, as we have left medievalism and entered an era of growing democracy, many people have taken the monotheisms of their ancestors and made them more playful. God becomes once again a friend rather than a power to be feared. People stop arguing about which religion is right. They begin to act again to acknowledge that such arguments make no more sense than do arguments about whether chess or checkers is the one true game. If this hopeful trend continues, we may complete the circle and once again enjoy playful religion as hunter-gatherers did. To keep religion on the side of humanity against, instead of against it, we need continuously to refresh its playfulness. Sacred play promotes the best of our human nature, improves our well-being, and is fun. Religion lacking play is suicidal. A short reflection now from Tony McNeil. Please sit comfortably, close your eyes if you wish, and try to imagine everything that Tony mentions in this piece. Let us go to the park. Here is a place of childhood memories. I remember the swings and Gray's knees. I remember the lake and rowing boats. I remember the flower beds with their lines of colour. I remember the shrubbery where we played hide and seek. Let us walk together and remember our parks. It was an age of innocence where we played together and all grew up together, siblings and friends playing out all day. I don't remember rain and I don't remember cold. I only remember summer and the day Pat fell off his bike into the lake. As we stroll through today, it might seem smaller than we remember. Remember the energy we had then and how simply joyous our lives were. As we walk and remember, passing those well-known landmarks, recall that innocence and find it again within our hearts. It may be buried under years of life, but it will be there. It is the spark of light deep within that helped us through the dark days and bad times that came after innocence. You may have wandered far away from this childhood place, or you may have brought the new generation of children and grandchildren here and watched them play. Remember them too and how they relit the flame that is deep within. Remember the love that flowed from you as you watched them in their days of freedom. Enjoy this time and be at ease. The gates will be closed at dusk and the park will find its own peace. Let us share that peace and those memories. The park is always there. 
now we're going to play a game. Thank you for playing, folks. Um, right, I'm going to speak a little bit on the definition of play and ideas for bringing play into one's life. I'm going to cut it slightly short. Um, but let's talk first about what play actually means. So we've had quite a heavy discussion of how play might fit into religion, one person's perspective, um, but we haven't actually looked at this definition. So Dr. Scott Eberle uh, writes that defining play is difficult because it's a moving target, it's a process, not a thing. Dr. Stuart Brown calls it a state of being, purposeless, fun and pleasurable, with the focus on the actual experience, not on accomplishing a goal. Dr. Peter Gray, who we heard from earlier, writing for Psychology Today, states that in fact, play cannot be neatly defined. An activity that may be playful for one person may be torture for another. But he states that play essentially boils down to imaginative, non-literal activity that is self-directed and self-chosen, meaning that you choose what you do, where and when to stop, in which the means are more valuable than the ends, with rules that emanate from the minds of the players rather than from the physical world, and which involves an active, alert, but non-stressed frame of mind, which might sound familiar to anybody who's looked at the concept of flow. Um, play can be defined as any recreational activity, and I think the presence of the word creation here is, is quite important. Play should involve one's imagination, let loose, and free to run away with itself. Play should be pointless, for its own sake, and totally immersive, not necessarily with any perceived outcome. Research has shown that play is not just a fun part of childhood, it's actually essential to the healthy development of the brain. Children who don't play cannot solve puzzles, have little psychological resilience, grow up more anxious, depressed, lonely, and those who are severely play-deprived exhibit extremely maladaptive behaviours as adults, with some cases leading to criminality and even homicide. But we tend to leave it there and think that if we've successfully played as children, uh, then we don't need to play as adults. Uh, in fact, in adults, play is still a hugely important way to maintain a healthy brain. If you play more, you are a more creative thinker, a better problem solver, you will laugh more, and laughter is an excellent anti-inflammatory, leading to lower stress and better vascular health. You are more in the now, and in general, people who live more in the now are happier. And when you play with others, you connect more. It brings us closer as people, as communities, and as equals, forging bonds of trust and love. I'm going to share some of Angela Marchesani's suggestions on tinybuddha.com for playing more. She suggests, a long list, blow bubbles in the bath, hula hoop, teach your dog tricks, teach yourself one, be a surprise fairy, leaving little tokens or gifts for someone to find, they'll have to show to you, preferably in public, dance, preferably in public, use stickers liberally everywhere. Write silly poems on the envelopes to your bills. Angela's latest to the electricity company expressed her relief at the rising temperatures and the lowered energy bill and wished the reader a sunny afternoon. Leave a song on someone's voicemail. Play with clay. Run down a hill, draw on the walls. Give in to an urge. It's 11 p.m. and you're suddenly compelled to drive to the beach? Do it. Not all urges are irresponsible. Borrow a kick. If you already have one, borrow another one for a change of pace. Go to the playground, push them on the swings, go round the merry-go-round, and when other adults adult shoot a look at you, smile, because you know a secret. Play an instrument. Make a fairy garden. Throw a party. Other researchers have suggested maybe going and finding your old toys, or thinking about how you used to play as a child. Was it alone? Was it with other people, other children? Um, did it involve your imagination and in what ways? And then go and do some of it again. Play is not just beneficial for the individual though. Dr. Peter Gray in his Play Makes Us Human series of essays, um, one of which we read earlier, outlines how play can lead to greater social equality. He writes, social play is the enemy of hierarchy and dominance. It demands equality. Play, by de definition, cannot be coerced. If two monkeys are playing together, they must both feel free, not threatened or dominated by the other. To engage in such play, they must set status aside, otherwise any monkey who is subordinate will run away or freeze, and the game will end. In order to play with subordinate monkeys, dominant monkeys must suppress all signs of dominance. If they are stronger, they must self-handicap. In human beings, the spirit of play can seduce all sorts of activities, including productive work. 
And when this happens, the playful mode of governance can trump and defeat the hierarchical mode. Hunter-gatherer peoples throughout the world seem to have understood this, and they use this knowledge, more or less deliberately, to arrange their entire social existence in a manner that permitted them to avoid hierarchy, dominance, and coercion. Gray doesn't advocate a complete governmental change. He says that our global and national systems are too complicated for that. Uh, and we still require a certain amount of hierarchy and dominance to maintain order. But at a more local level in our communities and schools, he suggests that a playful society leads to cooperation, sharing, and equality. If you're still concerned that playful, uh, being playful has no place in adult life, let me distinguish between being playful and childlike and being childish. Uh, the latter is immaturity, it's a failure to learn appropriate behaviours in various situations and exhibiting some that can actively harm other people and your own well-being, whereas the former is curiosity at its best, it's a sense of wonder, a joyful and open exploration of the world, one's place in it and one's links to other people. I want to leave you with what the actor Bob Basso said, if it's not fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs>
Many people associate it with messing around, with a lack of productivity, a waste of time or a fruitless endeavour. But play is a vitally important thing. In a message to the headmasters of its schools, the Church of England recently said, and I quote, In the early years and throughout primary school, play should be a hallmark of creative exploration. Pupils need to be able to play with the many cloaks of identity. Children should be at liberty to explore the possibilities of who they might be without judgment or derision. That's the words of the Church of England. For me, play is about exercising our creativity. I consider myself very lucky to have absolute free reign of creativity in my work and a job that is basically 100% creative. But for me, writing is work. I can't do it 24-7 and not feel ill effects. I need other outlets. I need to be able to relax, to read, and I need to be able to play. Many people find their pets help them to play. That having a dog or a cat around the house can help them to access their own playful nature. I sometimes like to use a different creative gear and play with paint on canvases or to compose pictures on paper. Some find sport to be a great release, either a team sport like badminton or something more solitary like walking or rock climbing. For me, play is about doing something active that is not considered work, often something that isn't a means to an end, but rather an end in itself. We're going to pray again. This is a prayer from the Unitarian Minister, Kate Dean, in Sterling's 2018. When did we stop pulling silly faces? When did we decide that being grown up meant putting away childish things? It is time to reclaim these pleasures we abandoned so that we don't have to think hard to remember the last time we danced until our feet hurt or laughed until we cried. I rejoice in the pastimes of my younger years and rediscover my sense of play. Amen. Time now for the notices and the collection of these. Run, jump, skip, hop. Climb over a low wall. Look for bugs underneath a rock. Fly a spaceship down the hall. May all the fun and joy of the universe play out over your lives this week. May you find the time to play. Amen. Mm -hmm.